Hello and welcome everyone to the Drock Show. I am incredibly excited about today's episode. This is something that I've been, uh, since I first sent out feelers for who wanted to be on, this was one of the first people who volunteered and I was immediately thrilled. This has been booked for a while. Uh, I'm talking today to Adam Canvas. Do you want to introduce yourself, Adam? Yeah, yeah, my name's Adam Canvas. Uh, I, I'm a multifaceted artist, I guess. I, I, I have my hands in a lot of pots in terms of uh, my creative expressions, uh, nice. including illustration, fire spinning, multimedia, digital art. Yeah, I took a look at uh, a lot of your stuff on your Instagram, and uh, I, oh, yeah. I, I think I love your artwork. It's oh, thank really you. hard not to just be drawn into how fucking rad the fire, fire spinning is. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Thank it, you. It it demands attention. Uh, how did you? I I think I just want to start there. How did you get into sure. fire spinning? Sure. Um, I had seen fire spinning in my college days. I went to Mass College of Art in Boston, and every so often they had these events called Iron Pours, where the metal sculpture department would uh, do these large pours of molten iron into you know sculpture forms in in the courtyard there and they would always make a big deal about it um there would be artists performing music um and they had some people coming in and spinning fire as well i had never really seen it before it was it was really interesting i i think the first one i saw was probably someone spinning staff um and it definitely mesmerized me a bit but i was still kind of uh getting into art in general so it got kind of swept along with a lot of the other really cool and talented people I've seen and, and artwork that I was doing. Um, I finally made it out to Burning Man um, in 2011 with some friends. Uh, one of my friends is in a band and they knew someone running one of the camps there and they wanted some musicians. So he, he pulled along a lot of us and I got to see much more out there. Um, and that made a much bigger impact. It, it's uh, much more of a staple on the west coast than it is the east coast i'm much more on the east coast close to the boston oh that makes a lot of sense it, yeah wild that you get to have an origin story with fire spinning that involves burning man <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was something that was the first uh festival type experience that i had had so it was it was a doozy of a first step <laughs> but it, it really made an impact on me it, it's very hard to watch that many talented people do things that they are really great at and you know l let alone something as unique as fire spinning that uh, especially on the east coast and especially in a tinderbox city like boston uh, isn't isn't really encouraged a lot um but i didn't really have a as personal of an experience with it as i did the following year um we met some other friends there at the big burn who told us about a uh, regional burn in the northeast which is it's events that happen around the country they aren't necessarily directly affiliated with burning man or that organization but they follow the 10 principles that burning man is kind of founded on okay um, i didn't know about the 10 principles uh, do you mind oh. going through that real quick yeah yeah it's a it's kind of a great little um guideline that was created by the original founder of burning man larry harvey um back in the mid 2000s um I'll list them off real quick. Uh, radical inclusion, uh, gifting, decommodification, radical self-reliance, radical self-expression, communal effort, civic responsibility, uh, leaving no trace, participation, and immediacy. Um, and they're they're more or less self-explanatory, but um, you know, it, uh, on the surface, it's um, it's welcomes everybody into the community. Um, it encourages unconditional gift giving. Um, it encourages um, a, a noticeable lack of commercial sponsorships or any kind of commercial transactions, actions or advertising. Um, relying on yourself uh, and your own inner and outer resources to be able to pull your own weight. Um, Self-expression for expressing whatever it is that is in you for art. Um, that you are kind of giving as a gift to other people, um, a communal effort, which it you know all of Burns are community efforts. They're they're very different from normal music festivals in that sense of the word. You're you're there to 
not just see amazing things and and uh, be enthralled by everything going on, but also to help make it happen. Um, I think that's a big part of Burns is they're all volunteer run for the most part, at least the regional ones. Um, I, I actually didn't know that. I hadn't uh, heard someone. I, I've talked to people who've been, but I've never heard that aspect explained. I think that's very important to the identity. Yeah, for for the larger Burning Man, there is a, an organization that runs it. I believe they're a nonprofit. But for I, from what I know of the regionals that I've heard of, they are pretty much mostly volunteer run. They are not profit industries or anything like that. Um, communal effort. Uh, I just went over uh, civic responsibility. Is um, it kind of ties into the next one, which is leaving no trace. Is you're you're kind of valuing um, public welfare. Uh, not just uh, conceptually, um, but also physically, uh, respecting the space and leaving it better than you found it. Um, participation kind of speaks for itself. But everyone's invited to come play. Everyone's invited to come work. Um, and immediacy is um, one of the ones that I feel like is is highlighted among a lot of the others. Uh, you're You're trying to be in the moment more or less and really connect with what's happening around you and who's around you and all that um so those are those are the 10 principles of of burning man and a lot of the regionals uh as they're referred to the regional burns um kind of have smaller versions of burning man where they try to emulate it based on these values burning man itself is i think probably close to 60 70k people at this point for a week out in the nevada desert oh my god that's where... that's so much to imagine it, it's it's a lot it is it is overwhelming i've been i think four or five times and every single time i've been it's it's just still awe inspiring but the the smaller ones the regional burns are still in their own right very awe inspiring but a little bit more manageable on the scale uh for reference the one that i attend called firefly which is in the northeast takes place in vermont and kind of pulls in the whole northeast um burner scene but some people from further away uh last year we had about i believe 1200 people so re really much smaller uh, than than the big burn uh and it is in the vermont woods as opposed to uh the nevada desert so I, it makes things a little more manageable I, I am if there's going to be one of those that has 60,000, one of those that has 1,000. I'm glad the one in, in the in the woods is not the one with 60,000. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. There's a, there's a little bit more responsibility to take with the um, with the landscape. You know, each, each environment has its own things to worry about and um, things to clean up after yourself for, but the forest is, is definitely its own beast, for sure. Mm -hmm. So... What sort of performances were that uh, kind of drew you in, and how did you how did you make the plunge? What was your first step from being enthralled to trying to learn it yourself? Well, after I I attended Firefly, and even just halfway through the week, I was kind of in the same state as I was even at Burning Man, where it's just like, wow, this is huge. These people are amazing. Such talent. They must have been practicing their whole life. They're levels above me. It it felt the same as watching something like Cirque du Soleil to me it, it you know mm -hmm. I I was just overwhelmed by the talent and felt that it was almost you know something that you just naturally look at and like wow that's amazing out of reach though and with Firefly being so small um, it's much easier to walk around and talk to people and get to know people and um, it I would watch someone perform you know this mesmerizing act of spinning a staff and doing uh, what's called contact moves, which is moves where you're not necessarily spinning it with your hands, but it is rolling along your body, and it almost looks like it's stuck to your body as you're manipulating it around. And the dude came and sat down next to me and the people I knew. He was a friend of a friend, and we just hung out in a group, and we talked, drank a few beers, things like that, and it just settled in after a little bit as obvious as it seems now is just oh this this is just a dude and you know he he's he's a nice guy and everything but he doesn't seem any uh you know not to be mean about it but he, he seems on the level with me he doesn't seem any more <laughs> particularly talented or or anything except for the the discipline to take the time and learn um mm. so it was kind of at that moment you know I, I i talked to people more about it and as soon as you talk to anybody in that community 
about saying, hey, I'm, I'm kind of curious, I'd kind of like to learn. People are generally very, very welcoming. It's, from what I've experienced in the fire spinning community, they, they understand the concept of wanting more talent in the pool. Getting more talent in the pool isn't a zero-sum game. It doesn't take away attention or anything for the rest of us. It, it only adds to the art itself, to the community that you're in. So everyone is very, very excited to get you started doing any kind of spinning. People will gladly show you, show you moves. Um, in Boston, there are people who organize a couple of spin jams every week, which is just people getting together not lighting stuff on fire, but just spinning your props unlit, doing kind of impromptu workshops or teaching moves to people, um, as well as uh, a couple of annual events that they use for a little bit more dedicated towards these are classes for props. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I started attending those. And a lot of, like I said, a lot of people that I had met in the Firefly community were already there. So it was easy to talk to them and pick their brains about things. Um, I originally started trying to learn staff because it, it was what originally attracted me to the art. Um, it was a little bit tougher for me to get started after a few classes. I wasn't really feeling it click. Um, a lot of people refer to, you know, you get into kind of a flow state where it feels good. Even if you're putting in effort, everything seems to kind of flow out of it. Um, things are going smooth. Uh, and I didn't really feel that until I uh, was trying a couple other random courses, I picked up a rope dart, which is, um, most people know it from the movie Kill Bill. Uh, okay, from that makes sense. The Go-Go character, yeah. But that that's essentially a rope dart, what she had. Having the chain as a rope is a little bit unrealistic, the, her poor palms. Um, but usually it's uh, a long rope with a weight uh, on the end of it. There are kind of several different shapes. Um, but that I picked it up, and it just instantly really clicked with me uh, i wasn't an expert right away or anything but it felt good and it felt like every failure was learning which is another really great aspect that the spinning community teaches you um I'd, I'd say you know i i practiced pretty hard for um probably five to six months uh, until i felt pretty comfortable about not hitting myself and, and knowing a couple of moves and I borrowed a friend's rope dart and, and spun some fire in the backyard for the first time, I believe, in 2012, 2013, maybe? 2013, yeah. What's that experience like the first time you go from understanding the momentum and knowing the theory behind it to suddenly there's actually fire involved, getting close to your body, being flung, and you are solely responsible for a flame? It is... It's overwhelming. It's it's terrifying. It's exciting. I will say the thing that always sticks with me, frankly, even to this day, is just how loud the fire is when it's around you. You are so that. used to, as a human, having fire in front of you and having it static, more or less. Mm -hmm. It's sitting in the fireplace. It's sitting on the campfire. It's on the candle. Um, but, you know, if, if you really think about it, even in things like movies or if you've ever held an actual torch or anything like that, the fire does whoosh a bit as it goes from side to side. So you turn that into constant motion and you have just a... I would have never thought about that, but I, I can imagine yeah. that would feel kind of overwhelming at first, going from the near silent dagger floating through the air to this mm -hmm. roar. Yeah, it's 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 really something. Um, it At least for me, it instantly made me... You know, it, it's fire anyway. It made, but it made me respect it even more. With this, the sound that I I was totally unaware of, and this element that's like, oh yeah, fire, sure, humans master fire, we're good with it. And then you're all of a sudden seeing this this different side of it, where it is moving around you, and like you said, you are responsible for it, and you are in you know a decent bit of uh, at least just danger of slight injury. I wouldn't say it's it's too life threatening, mm -hmm. but it it is. It's overwhelming and calming at the same time to me. I, I find it a very easy form of active meditation. Uh, it's it's very easy to stay in the moment when it is something you are concentrating on and uh, feeling it move along with your body and trying to control it as, as you wish to control it. That but, makes a lot of sense because I've, I've heard from a lot of people that um, an aspect of good meditation, because meditation is just focus like realistically focus is what meditation is so a lot of people find activities that demand focus are like uh, a hack towards meditation so 
I can't imagine like it, that risk of harm has to force meditation in a sense once you get good enough that you're not terrified. Yeah, to a degree, I feel like that might it it stands there a little bit more as the quote unquote danger at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But I think like a lot of things, once you get a couple of taps, you realize that it's not that bad. Okay. A lot of a lot of people always ask like, "Oh, aren't you scared you're going to you're going to catch on fire or I have a big beard and everyone always asks if I'm going to burn my hair off." And it's really not like you would picture it. it. It it's not as Hollywood as the fire touches you and you're instantly immolated and running around. Anybody who's um, tried to start a campfire knows that that's not how fire works. <laughs> yeah, if only it was that easy for those moments. <laughs> but the fuel that we generally use, the props themselves are made of, Kev of Kevlar, mm. of all things. Um, and we, there are a lot of different fuel sources, but the ones that I know that most people use are, are white gasoline or camping fuel. Mm -hmm. um, they used to be used a lot more in camping stove, but those have gone more propane lately. So they're a little bit tougher to find, but you can find them in the right hardware store. Um, it is a uh, odorless burning and um, smokeless burning. And, you know, clean burning, so very different from gasoline or anything else that would put out a lot of smoke. That makes sense. Um, and large, large amounts of fumes. Um, but the fire is, is basically just burning the fuel, which is soaked into the Kevlar like a sponge. So if you get tapped by the prop while you're spinning, you might get a quick little singe. You might get a couple of, of frayed ends uh, on the end of your, you know, body hair or head hair. Mm -hmm. Um but a lot of people just toss some water on themselves if, if it's going to be a particularly big flame flame and that they're not comfortable with. Um, and most spinners uh, become aware very quickly that the most danger you're in for injury is towards the start when the fuel is still soaked very, very saturated into the prop and hasn't burned away as much yet. So there is a possibility that if the prop hits against your body it can transfer some of the fuel onto you, much like a sponge that's a little bit overloaded, and that fuel could still be burning. Oh. So that, that's really the only, I'd say, the the most common danger and a lot of the most common times that fuel transfer would happen. But these are calculated risks, and adding to the safety of this is um, the knowledge that most good fire spinners will pass along, which is do not wear synthetic fibers, <laughs> wear natural fibers. That is very good advice. Um, it's very important advice. And honestly, it, it's something that I always try to extra emphasize because it is one of those things that can go out the window if you start becoming a little too used to it. And, oh, I've, I've spun fire for this many years. It's fine. I don't need – I'm not going to hit myself. I can wear whatever I want, and it's fine. But uh, it, in reality, there have been plenty of stories about you know, established veterans of the community getting large burns on their body from wearing a synthetic costume and, and lighting it up. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really rough. It can happen to the best of us. So, um, you know, reducing the risk like that, uh, at the start, uh, with the spinner is, is one way to reduce it. Uh, another way is that any, any good practicing spinner will have what's, you know, a fire safety, someone else, that is there to help them out and watch them to make sure they stay safe with fire. And that person is generally always using uh, what's called a duvetine uh, or a fire blanket. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a uh, uh, cloth piece of cloth, you know, about the size of your chest or a little bit bigger. And it's coated with a, a flame retardant material. So it's used in case somebody's, you know, if someone's genes say get a little bit of fuel transfer on it and it's not quite going out or, the person quite can't get to it. The fire safety's job is first to yell out, hey, leg, fire. <laughs> Let the person know. Give them a chance to put it out themselves, which if you, you know, you press and push and swipe, not pat, <laughs> because patting gives oxygen to fire, and we do not want that. Um, smothering the fire real quick uh, can generally be done pretty easily, but if it's in an odd spot, or if the person for some reason doesn't hear their safety, the safety is expected to run up with the blanket and kind of smother that spot and put it out really quick. Um, they can also use the blanket in, in the event that for some reason or another, the spinner needs to stop. Maybe their prop got tangled or uh, they're having a, a wardrobe malfunction or uh, got an unexpected injury, anything like that. Uh, they can do the same thing with the duvetine on the prop and just smother it out really quickly. So mm -hmm. between those two things, 
again, calculated risks, uh, knowing where your weak points are and just keeping an eye on them. Um, the more you see how well that works with yourself and other people, the more confident you get, I think, with the fire. Have you ever found yourself in need of your fire safety uh, in a significant way, or have you been mostly just that's there in case? Um, no, I mean, I've definitely had a couple of incidents. I wouldn't say they were really huge. Uh, my biggest one was I was kind of doing this move where the dart goes up behind my back and swings down around the front, and it just caught on my shoulder just a little too early and swung down and honestly just baffed me right in the eye. And it wasn't really the fire damage that got me. It no. just one of those really solid, yep, that poked my eyes hard enough that I need to close both eyes. Uh. Um, so in that case, I, I just dropped to my knee. I, I put the dart as far away from me as possible. And I just called out for the safety and they put it out. And that was that. Um, I recovered in a couple minutes and that was fine. Um, but, you know, I've had countless other times of just someone yelling out to me, hey, leg or hey, arm. Mm -hmm. something something really quick like that uh to put out here and there but no major incident uh incidents you know knock on wood but uh i i do try to stay vigilant i don't like i said i i want to respect the fire it is a very destructive element and it, and it can do a lot of damage very quickly if you let it so uh you, while you are you know experienced in controlling it, it it can still always get out of hand it's like uh it's, it's good to consider it like a wild animal i think it's sometimes okay it sounds like, um, I mean, obviously, uh, you build this very, uh, this much clearer understanding of exactly what fire is and does when you use it as a medium compared to, uh, I think the average person has probably only ever experienced fire as a tool rather than a medium. Yes. Um, it's like how uh, a carpenter understands a blade a lot better mm -hmm. than someone who's only ever used that for... Uh, cooking yes yeah i think that's a good example in fact you see you see a good carpenter at work or even a good chef with a really sharp knife and they'll be working pretty fast and they'll have comfort with the tool mm -hmm. even if they're still respecting it and understanding how it can hurt them but their experience and their time and their relationship with their body mechanics uh provides them that confidence in moving forward of okay here's how i do it safely well i think you just highlighted something with the saying um, understand how it can hurt them. I think if you understand how something can hurt you that uh, fully, that comes with also understanding the ways that it doesn't hurt you. Yes. Uh, so you don't give necessarily the credence that someone might in unnecessary places. I also, I, I think you're definitely right that people focus on the, aren't you scared of the fire element? Cause that's where my brain goes to the point that when you mentioned just getting hit in the eye with a heavy object, uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't until that moment that I went, Oh, right. There's a heavy thing flying around quickly also that I haven't yes. been considering in this. Yes. And each prop kind of br brings its own, you know, s sense that you have to take. Something like a rope dart, for instance, is a little bit different in how you manage it. You have uh, a weight on a string or a rope, rather, and it is uh, a lot of centrifugal force and a lot of uh, knowing where something it is in is in a rotation how you can handle the momentum, where you can direct the momentum, things like that. For something like, say, staff, which is a, a lot more of a uh, static prop, you are more worried about where the weight is, where the center point is, which way it can go, and if one of those larger fire wicks on the end are coming towards you when the staff is, is swinging around. Um, those are completely different from poi spinners, which I... I have all the respect in the world for poi spinners. Most of the props that I do are referred to as single-handed props. Something like rope dart, even though I'm, I am using both hands, it's tied to one of my wrists and the other one's kind of guiding it. Um, I am kind of doing the same thing with both hands, more or less, whereas poi spinners have basically a, a tiny rope dart on each hand with a shorter stick, and they are doing different things with each hand. It's very ambidextrous feats, and it is... It, it is amazing to watch that, and that has a whole whole different set of dangers to watch out for when you have two little ropes that are doing different things at the same time. So you oh, you kind of just get to know each prop and its personality and its strong points and its weak points and its sneaky points where it wants to try to bite you. <laughs> uh, and 
and you just you roll with that and you work around it and you you fail upwards and you learn does anything stand out to you as through your experience in kind of learning mastering uh, getting the hang of this whatever however you want to feel about it is there any point that stands out to you as like one of your favorite moments in developing and practicing the skill ah oh, that's interesting um i mean honestly i i think it would have to be when i started picking up a couple new props um it's it's really interesting to watch your brain figure out how things are the same but different like i said i kind of had a, a bit of a problem really clicking with staff when I first started. Um, but the concept of it still interests me. So a couple years after I was into rope dart, I went back and I took some staff classes. And while I'm still not quite as talented in staff, mostly because I, I haven't put in the hours, um, it clicked a little bit more with me once my brain kind of had locked in a little bit of knowledge about the physics of rope dart. Um, mm. it, was, it was interesting uh, seeing myself trying to spin a staff kind of improv and freeform and, and feeling like it was a rope dart and I was still using it like a rope dart. Um, so that was a fun, a fun little brain click that you can feel going and you're like, Oh, I get it. Same, but different, same, but different. Okay. Um, and I think that really kind of came to a peak for me when, um, there, I, I found out that people spin fire axe or at least a couple of people do. It's not a very wide, uh, widely used prop, but there's another separate event that's not affiliated with um, Firefly called Wildfire that happens up here in the Northeast, and it is just basically a weekend dedicated to uh, teaching fire spinning classes and, and prop classes and dance and movement, uh, mm -hmm. everything within that, and um, they have classes all day, they have communal meals, it's kind of a camping trip, you know, communal camping trip, um, and then every night they basically have kind of a, a big burn field, which is, you know, they clear one of the larger fields. And as long as you have a safety, you can just um, jump out and spin fire for as much as long as you want. Um, and one person there had this gigantic fire axe that I saw one time. And it, it really, it, it, it felt like I was seeing fire spinning for the first time all over again. It was just so cool to see that much fire and to see it, moving so differently because of the nature of the prop, the shape of the prop. Um, I talked to my partner who, you know, I, I also met at Firefly and through the fire spinning comedian who is, I'm lucky, who is also a fire spinner. Um, she saw, she saw that in my eyes for sure. And I mentioned, you know, even just offhand, like, man, I need to figure out how to get one of those. Um, and she was able to commission one from the, um, the fire prop company me that again luckily enough for me is located right here in boston um huh. and so they were able to make this this really nice prop uh it's essentially it's the shape of a classic kind of double-headed battle axe um the kevlar itself is in a flat piece in the shape of that battle axe and there are uh it's sandwiched in by aluminum pieces on either side um so that the edges are still open to the kevlar Okay. Um, and man, I, I swung that around and the weight was different and even just swinging around an unlit <laughs> ax shaped thing really just fulfilled a lot of, uh, childhood, uh, pretend fantasies about fighting ninjas and orcs and all that. <laughs> but man, the first time I lit that on fire, uh, you know, I'd always felt like a fire spinner, but when I, I was able to spin and handle that thing lit up, it, it felt like I was getting really getting somewhere. It felt like, okay, I'm, I'm leveling up in this. I'm, I'm starting to feel comfortable. This is this definitely something I want to keep doing. Um, and it, it was just really great to feel this surge of confidence for that. Um, confidence that, you know, sprung out of, again, a, a terrifying and exciting moment of lighting that up. And if you think something, you know, the size of your fist, like a rope dart is loud when it's on fire, <laughs> Uh, I really, with no exaggeration, the only way I can compare this, the size of this axe's flame is, uh, it just, it's a campfire on a stick. Oh my and, god. 
I like to, I've 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 rolled with the joke of when I talk to people about it, I say eh, it's maybe a little too much fire, but it's fine. And there's a lot of truth in that. <laughs> I'd say. <laughs> Oh, that's so rad, though. Hey, how would you, how would you phrase the difference of feeling of swinging around like a torch versus a campfire? Like, how how does it feel in, in your body to be swinging that much weight and heat around and noise? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's again kind of same but different. Like I said about a lot of props, um, it almost feels like. You know, if if you're playing video games, it feels like you're just doing a different class. The the smaller one is a lot more about dexterity and being a little bit fancier and pulling out the speed. Um, and you're still obviously doing deliberate motions, but you're you're kind of really rolling with the momentum, thinking about your next move while you're doing your current one, feeling things come up really fast. Um, mm -hmm. It feels very light and airy. I've been able to throw in a couple of jumps and things even in there into my routines over the year. But with the axe, it's uh, it's much more grounded. It's a much more tanky feel, uh, a much more kind of earth-based class. I feel like I very much stomp my feet. I get rooted in the earth. I make large, big, deliberate movements. Um, the momentum, I feel like, doesn't carry me away as much as the rope dart does. Whereas the rope dart sometimes feels like I am directly dancing with it, with the rope dart leading sometimes. Uh, whereas the axe feels uh, a little bit more, um, you know, like I'm I'm in charge here, even even if uh, I'm a little scared of it. <laughs> like uh, almost like it it demands your respect to the point that you need to be assertive with it. Yes, yes, I think that's a very good way to put it. The uh, the rope dart feels more like a gentleman's agreement and the the axe is more uh, a, a firm reminder of uh, you know who what's going on here and what I have to pay attention to so it, it sounds like a lot of uh, what a lot of the appeal a lot of the community um, that you've talked about is very much centered in that uh, same music festival mentality of um, collaboration and sharing uh, especially in the effort to push people or uh, to, to introduce people to it when they're curious to make it accessible. Um, has there ever been any issues in the community while you've been a part of it uh, with like corporatism? Because I remember years ago that thing where like um, contact juggling was going corporate and that was like a calamity mm -hmm. in the contact juggling community has there any been has there been anything similar in fire spinning to that not that i'm aware of uh you know i i definitely fire spin a fire spun professionally i'll say honestly not nearly as much as some of my friends do uh, a lot of them i've i've done fire spinning for money for some nice side money here and there i've been in you know insured so that i can do events i've done some private events i've done some public events um and it's been fun but i i know people that travel the country Mm -hmm. to do this and and have busy seasons like that and at least in my experience um we've never really seen anything go corporate the only corporate that we've seen is corporate events suddenly being like oh hey this looks like luxury entertainment can we get this we'll pay you and everyone here is very excited again just like yeah pay us it's fine we're gonna come <laughs> do our thing and be weird and our art form is gonna get more popular yes absolutely sign me up um but it, we've, at least as far as I know, in, in the community I've been around, I've never really felt uh, any issues like that, any any corporate commercialism taking over. You know, uh, the, the 10 principles aren't, that I mentioned earlier, aren't really just, you know, hand-wavy suggestion things. It's, it's you know, it's, it's drilled into us constantly when you're joining the community in, in all the best ways, and you are reminded about it constantly, especially when you are teaching other people about it, and you... You really, you, you realize how important they are when you see them in action, I think. And that's really what makes them different from just some suggested guidelines or rules. It's, it's really like nothing else when you can go to an event with over a thousand people and not see one bit of advertising, not have one person try to sell you anything. It's, it's, it's the break that we all wish we had whenever we see the billboards 
overcrowding the highways or we groan at another commercial break on the TV, anything mm -hmm. like that, or, you know, wanting to go somewhere and be like, hey, does everything cost money here? And these burns are a place to really be like, oh, nothing costs money here. This is great. Yeah, decommodification. I completely understand it. Um, and, you know, it's things like that aren't fully sustainable in our society and world yet <laughs> due to the way that everything is. But it's, mm -hmm. it's really nice to see it work on a small scale. It's nice to see people being inspired by it and trying to take what they see from these short festivals and bring what they can back into the real world um even if it's just you know the concept of it and explaining to other people or trying to push more of it in in the community uh, at large you know so let me know if this is just um an insane nothing take but uh there's this um concept in early punk culture called rotten uh, where the idea was to live off of and promote the use of aspects of uh, the modern society that had been deemed unfit for, basically for consumption, but more unfit for profitability, um, mm -hmm. and to reclaim the rotten as a way of life. And I feel like there's kind of something inherently bound to classical punk thinking and fire spinning it feels like because of the appearance of danger it feels kind of inherently unmarketable if that makes any sense like it is itself the punk definition of rotten it is something that it is so hard to commodify outside of this market you've talked about where it's um one-to-one -one exchanges uh bespoke equipment being made uh, it feels like it's suited to this far more human form of commerce. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, and what you're saying there, I think I can definitely feel a Venn diagram overlap of that. It definitely meets a lot of the same values. Um, you know, I know it, it's commodified to a decent degree, um, but mainly in performance. And mm -hmm. I feel like that, that starts to be a nebulous area where you're talking about, you know, is, is a Broadway show a commodity or is it art? Well, you know, that, that, that starts getting a whole other rabbit hole where maybe it's both, maybe it's neither. Well, um, to the punk definition, that yeah. sort of thing is, is considered still to be, I mean, like the punk theory is all over the place, so I'm not going to pretend sure. it's <laughs> unanimous, but that, that one-to-one -one exchange of hiring someone to perform or putting on a show is seen as like a human form of commerce in a lot of punk theory that is yeah. still viable because there needs to be some level of exchange in human culture. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely see that. I mean, like I said, at least from what I've seen, it's most of my experience with fire spinning has been, you know, one on one for fun for part of the art community. And frankly, even the experiences I've had doing it for work for money, mm -hmm. um, there have been, you know, private events like backyard birthday parties or um, even for the corporate events. You know, it's, it's not for like a presentation or a show. It's for, you know, an employee weekend retreat or getaway to entertain people with. Um, I've even done it for um, Halloween season. Uh, there was a, a farm nearby that did a haunted corn maze uh, with a lot of characters in it. And one year... We were spinning out front just to, you know, generate excitement and, and have something unique to draw people in and entertain people while they were waiting in line. And within a couple of years, we had had such a good relationship with the people running it that they actually took our troop and uh, put us as one of the things you walk by in the haunted corn maze. So we had, you know, kind of a, a nice safe setup where we were a little bit distant from the people walking around, but we we're all dressed up like... Yeah, yeah, and from the corn, no popcorn that night. Um, it kind of uh, goes around the cornfield and then like into the woods behind it and then back again. And so we had a, a place out in a field for it. Um, but even like that, we were kind of dressed as this fire cult summoning kind of ritual, and um, oh, that's it, rad. it it was a lot of you know again, it's a one on one on one one on a few experience where you just have these small groups of people walking in and you you hear what they're saying to you and you see the expressions on their face uh and it it's just it's really nice seeing my own expression from the first few times i ever saw fire spinning in uh, both adults and children when when they see things like this and it it's 
it's really great. It, it, it makes it feel really nice to know that you're connecting with someone like that so closely. Oh yeah, that, that's got to be so powerful, especially knowing what that experience was for you, how meaningful it was. I can't mm -hmm. imagine how it would feel like to get to be giving that experience to people now. Yeah, it's something. You know, every, every time I see a small kid light up uh, in joy at seeing me or, or one of my friends fire spin, I just, you know, have that little hope in the back of my head and be like, ah, I hope you look into that. I hope you YouTube that and I hope you start. Well, some of them are definitely going to. I feel like... We with your story how it is and how basically everybody's stories about how they get into niche interests and hobbies and art forms i almost certainly with what you've done you've inspired someone at the very least i think about your story of how you started with axe uh spinning i think there is no way you haven't inspired someone who already spins to check out axes <laughs> yeah yeah for sure um even just in the community around me um you know i definitely get people asking to to spin the axe, and I've let a couple people do it. Um, there's only a couple people I've, I've trusted to do with it on fire, and I, I do have some strict policies leading up to that. I gotta watch you spin it not on fire. I gotta make sure mm -hmm. you're definitely 100% sober, and you know, no synthetic clothes. I gotta, I gotta be a big overlord over it. But um, it's, it's great to see uh, other people be inspired to pick up fire spinning. And frankly, the, the, the moments that are the most humbling for me are seeing other fire spinners in the community that I know have been doing it longer than me and mm. do other props, but watching them watch me and have the same expressions on their face as I do when I'm watching them and have them come up to me afterwards and be like, that was an amazing performance. That was incredible. I can't oh, believe you did what you man. did. And it's just, I, I, I can barely handle it sometimes of just, you know, it, uh, I'm so, I'm so lucky to uh, be in a supportive community like that and, and know that we all affect each other and we all just build on each other we all build each other up that's so goddamn cool to hear i i love that idea of like because you found uh, with the axe this unique piece that uh that i mean it, it's it is so rarely done like, I, I had never heard of it being a thing like i'd heard of rope darts mm. poi uh I think I saw someone do something with nunchucks, but that was probably yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Nunchucks is absolutely a thing. Okay. Oh yeah. I'm that, not making, that's always that wasn't very a dream. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Generally, people have it. Uh, they have it lit on the ends of the nun nunchuck, so you're still free that, to spin it so you can around the moves. train. Yeah. Because yeah. that's why I was yeah, thinking, it... maybe I dreamed that up. Was I'm like, but then how do you how do you do the moves if you can't grab the sticks? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's still impressive. I I can't believe. The, the things people do with things like that with the speed and dexterity but with but, but with this unique <laughs> aspect you get to have people who've done this longer than you still be blown away because you found like you found a unique niche in, in a niche art form yeah 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 it it, it feels nice I, I love bringing novel to people's day if i if i can brighten them up through something and um you know, it, it it's it's fun. I, I like to try to play play to my crowd if I know who's around me. So sometimes you can kind of feel out, and it's like, well, is this one I'm going to play kind of serious, or am I going to get a little bit goofy with that? I've I've ranged from, you know, uh, playing a a paid gig up in a place called Ice Castles in New Hampshire, which is literally they make a castle out of ice that you can walk around, <laughs> and um, they hired fire spinners, which is genius move. Um, and you know, if I'm I'm sitting there and they want it to be kind of mysterious and badass, so I'm wearing my hood, and they're playing, you know, some Game of Thrones cover. So I'm playing it super <laughs> serious, doing the badass stuff. People are gasping, mouth open. But then, you know, cut to me at Firefly. Or I'm around a bunch of my friends, and we're all spinning fire to Disney songs, and I'm doing <laughs> uh, the Gaston song <laughs> with my axe. Oh, that's uh, fantastic! And just really hamming it up. So it, it's it's a versatile art form <laughs> in that sense. I love that so much. It's so good to hear. Yeah, um, it's it's great. It's the some people I feel like that I've talked to here and there. They they don't really make it too big of a thing. But um, you know, I've had some some people say like, oh, you know, it's a little it's a little edge lord. You think isn't a little kind of close to like swinging around a mall katana? And you know, it's whatever they can think what they want to think. Oh, um, I. I Sorry, no, you go first. You go first. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, I, I personally, I, I like 
having the axe not just as a um, as a unique prop, you know, a niche within a niche, like like you mm-hmm. so wonderfully put, but it I like feeling a little bit more connected to kind of the origins of fire spinning, which um, you know I know there's there's a lot of mixed reading on it, and I know it's sometimes it's it's tough to find the exact origins because a lot of this stuff goes back before written tradition. I know that there's some things in scotland with their beltane fire festivals and appeasing fairy folk um but a lot of what we know from the earliest stuff i think is uh it's like polynesian Mm -hmm. um a lot of those fire dancers were tied directly into um their armies and their soldiers uh using these as performances to kind of show how skilled they were in battle with their weapons so it, it it feels like a neat little direct connection back to that 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 practice has made itself to us through land and and time and space and it's gone back around from looking looking pretty into you know showing your prowess with a a particular piece of equipment Mm -hmm. um so it it, it's neat in that sense and i do you know i i'd love to um try to honor the the traditions of it uh and where it come from uh where it came from um where i can because even the rope dart itself is um, from Chinese tradition, and we have not that much written history about that, just little bits and pieces that a lot of people always try to put together. So um, it's not just the fire dancing that, uh, you know, I'm kind of following in the footsteps of Shoulders of Giants and all that, but also just, you know, the equipment itself. And it's, it's really interesting to stop and think about that sometimes, that I'm just sitting there spinning to a Disney song and... and mm-hmm having fun with my friends because of this rich tradition that goes back thousands of years it's it's really surreal sometimes that's really cool to hear that you have that very respectful perspective on it and uh the history of this i i like hearing that a lot that uh i this idea of using a weapon kind of actually does go if being used as like a pre-battle uh ritual dance it kind of plays into that a bit more yeah yeah it's great um it kind of feels like you know there's the saying about turning swords into plowshares and it's like (laughs) well we kept the swords the swords but we just let them on fire because they're pretty now (laughs) i I mean there's probably if i would imagine it's uh, almost certain that like even without wartime uh fire dancing or fire, fire spinning sorry was still performed by those cultures uh yeah yeah, absolutely. Polynesian and, and Samoan cultures uh, really, really held it in high regard. Um, a lot of different, um, you know, things based in the military tradition. But again, like over time, things like that just naturally form into arts. You know, mm-hmm. battle battle was an art form when it would when it took up so much of life and it was so important in terms of your tribe and, and everything like that. But uh, if it turns into ritual that and tradition, that becomes even even more important, you know, um, and I know it, you know, it jumped from Polynesia to uh, New Zealand, and then of of course to Hawaii, and you know, very very rich tradition there. And I, you know, pun intended, I guess I, I wouldn't hope to hold a candle to um, <laughs> the Samoan styles, the Hawaiian sp- styles, uh, Tahitian styles. It's if you ever look up videos of those, it's it's just really unbelievable the the things they can do. And I I. I I have nothing but respect for that. I mean, my philosophy on art is that pretty much for every person, there is going to be something that they will see that they couldn't have created. And that's why regardless of where you perceive your own skill level, uh, art is worth doing for having done it. You are still contributing something that is exclusive to you. And I, I think when you talk about people you are certain are better than you uh being awed by what you're doing i i think that's that plays into that that idea that you're still contributing something incredibly you in the way that you're doing this yeah absolutely i think um it really pushes that idea of you know making art is is not just narcissistic and just for you when when you do it in the right context if you are doing it in a more you know public uh uh situation it you are directly doing it because you want to express yourself publicly and show other people about it but you know in hopes of getting other people 
to do it too. I, I mean, at least me personally, as, as an artist, if I have if anybody comes up to me and says like, "Hey, I'm doing this thing because of you," then that's you know, what else can you ask for as an artist, knowing that you haven't just brought your art into the world, but you have brought someone else's art, and then from that, someone else's art, and it can it can just be exponential from there. And that's what, uh, frankly, the whole of Firefly feels like, you know, as much as I've talked about just the, the fire parts of it is, you know, I'm sitting there doing a lot of my fire dancing, I, I do some body painting, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I help make and, and build some of the theme camps there, but you've got a lot of these engineers from the MIT crowd in Boston doing these really amazing LED lights and setups. Uh, a lot of these unbelievably high tech setups for something that's in, in the middle of the woods. That's just an art installation that, that looks amazing. And is this great mix of, uh, you know, science and art, uh, you have people making food and, and giving away meals and that's that's an art form in and of itself. You you've never really had pizza until you've had pizza that someone has expertly cooked in the middle of the woods, I feel like, you know? Um so it that's I think really the upside of, of finding a good arts community and, and really trying to be a part of it and participate in it. Because like I said earlier, you know, it's it's you're just building everyone else up if you're enjoying someone's art and you're enjoying it vocally and it is a situation where you can just literally walk up to that person and say hey i liked your thing it affected me really deeply please keep doing it you know what that that's directly contributing to the community that's making that person want to do more art and inspire you and inspire others and you know uh, do something with their own self-expression it's 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 a really good feeling to see that kind of feedback loop happen in a community. Yeah. So that's actually the segue. Uh, I want to talk to you about the arts community. I, yeah. What, just kind of broadly, the Firefly arts community, what is the, what are the goals? What do you, what do you do? What do you put on? Uh, talk me through the basics of it. Yeah. I mean, it is mostly centered around the event, which is, you know, yearly, usually in July around the 4th, um, it's the goal is to have a a multi-day arts festival that is uh, non-commercial, that is participatory, and that is community-driven. I think, like I like I mentioned at the at the start, it's all volunteers. No one is getting paid to be here. Uh, whether it's the person helping you park in the parking lot, the person you know helping uh, you know someone that needs help with it, bringing their bags all the way to their camp from their car. Or whether it's the people that are on, you know, the Firefly board making all the big decisions about, you know, how the budget is being spent and who's getting art grants and, and things like that. Everybody is there because they want to be. They are not getting paid. They care about this event. They care about this community. And they want it to happen. And as, as much as it is just mainly one event with a couple of other events scattered out throughout the year, um, the, the festival itself, the week-long festival itself is kind of the main point of it and it's it, i think it really speaks to the the scale of it to see how many people and how much time is needed just to make that one event happen every year uh you know to to the scale that we want it to happen you know but there's a whole month of work weekends before the event starts that again all volunteer run and all volunteer for if you go up and you go up you you camp out for a weekend and you do what needs to be done trees need to get cut down trails need to be cleared new trails need to be made anything like that uh, you're you're there and you're helping and then a couple weeks later you come to the event and you're like oh i dug that trail oh i cut down those trees in that clearing that someone's using as a fire circle now oh i cut that entire you know huge um plains worth of grass so that people can sit out in it and watch the stars you participating in it really gives you a sense of ownership and a, a real connection to the community and attending the festivals lets you see your direct the direct results of your of your efforts which again a feedback loop it feels good you see other people benefiting from what you're doing uh you're enabling artists to do great things with the space you like it you want to do it more other people see you doing it and how much you're enjoying it they jump in and hey next year you got a bigger work weekend the event gets better. It gets easier to do. Many hands make light work. 
That's so rad to hear. I love this idea of uh, it It being entirely volunteer-driven is so crazy. I, earlier when you were talking about Burning Man, it got me thinking about how, like, I feel like I've only ever heard uh, the external narrative of Burning Man. Um, now, mm. I'm, I'm a Canadian, so a, a lot fewer sure. people I know are likely to have been to it, and the Canadian art scene is... Mm -hmm. While most of Canadian and American culture are pretty similar, I'd say one of the more different things. I think Canadian art scene tends to be a little elitist sometimes. Mm, interesting. Uh, but hearing the internal perspective on these uh, on these events is so cool. It, it's it's so different than how I feel like it's pitched in broader media, and uh, yeah. it's really important to feel to to get a sense for the reality of it. Yeah, it's it's frustrating sometimes to kind of see the depictions and, you know, it I I can't deny some of the stereo, you know, some of the stereotypes exist for a reason, mm -hmm. but you know, when when you really look at it in context, you know, saying Burning Man is like this is like saying Boston is like this or Los Angeles is like this. Mm -hmm. You know, it it's it's very weird to completely condense what is an entire city, 60,000, 70,000 people into a one, one sentence of, oh, they're just doing this, or this is just a bunch of wooks, or a bunch of just smelly people who just want to do drugs or anything like mm -hmm. that. It's it's very reductive. And um, it is one of those things that, you know, and I sometimes hate when people say this, but I'm at a loss for anything else. It's very hard to really put into words what the experience is like unless you go and you do it. It is just a scale like nothing else. It is... Uh, an attitude pervasive around all the people around you that is like nothing else of just belonging and welcoming and inviting. And, you know, like I said, it is a city. And to a degree, your experience there is led by you and what you're doing, coming back to, you know, some of the the, the 10 principles, the the immediacy, the radical self-reliance. You know, if if you want to go out to Burning Man or any of these regional burns and just go crazy and not have responsibilities and dance all night and lose a ton of sleep, uh, you know, really get lost in the sauce, you know, <laughs> that that's your prerogative and the experience is there for you to do it. If you want to go out and you want to do nothing but get involved in the art and really look for the performances and uh, really get caught up in any of the interactive uh, art exhibits out there, um, then that's your prerogative as well. You know, there, there were a couple days at Burning Man where, you know, I, I chilled out at camp and I, I helped, you know, run the bar or I helped clean up some, um, some stuff for gray water or anything like that, that the camp needs all day. And then at night I hopped on my bike with a couple of friends and we just, you know, darted from art sculpture to art sculpture that we could see. It's like, Oh, that thing looks interesting. Let's bike over there. 10 minutes later, hang out at it go to the next one you know and and i i i'm perfectly happy with that experience and it's not something that comes out as a as a big stereotype a lot um mm -hmm. so anytime i hear somebody say you know burning man is this or you know all burns are like that or all festivals are like that you know it, it's hard to take seriously as frustrating as it is to hear the the stereotype perpetuated it there's so much more than the you know, downsides of what you hear. There's so much more to an event and a community that large driven by principles this strong than its worst parts, oh, you know? And, uh, you know, I think that's a the similar way that, you know, you can look at people really like people are, are you're more than your mistakes. You're more than your faults and you're, you're more than your weak points. You're what you choose to be and, and what you choose to do. And, Burns feel like a big recess to me. You can go play tag. You can go make fun of people behind the slide if you want. <laughs> you know, it again. It, it's a, it's directed a lot by you and what your openness to the experiences are like, and what your preconceived notions are like, and what you want to say yes and no to. I I like that. I like that mentality of it being about creating a radical freedom that just can't mm. exist in the long term something th this little island yeah 
to a degree it's an island i'd say you know like i said it, it you can in a capitalistic society you can only bring so much back sustainably every day but you can bring some of it back you know bringing back that that radical self-expression bringing back that feel of oh i you know i want to make this this thing i'm gonna make it even if it's weird or other people think it's weird or you know uh hey let's let's include those people in doing my thing regardless of what i think of them you know or what my preconceived notions are of them i think that's where a lot of the success of of the communities start to be like yes there's there's a whole list of things that you can say hey this is only really going to exist at burning man this is only going to really exist in a festival that happens once a week and is very contained but there's a lot of things that you can bring back out into the world and you know make things a little bit more like the burn back at home uh and it's very hard to not want to do that when you when you're out there and you really feel what it can be like and, you know even if even if you can't ever hit that perfect ideal back in the real world you, you can strive for it and i think that's that's where good things really start happening so are there any major projects you're working on right now uh, for festivals in your community, your personal practice? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a larger part of the Firefly community. I mentioned really briefly, you know, um, I I help run one of the theme camps there mm -hmm. at Firefly. It's not just individual camping. It's, um, you know, larger people, groups of people like at Burning Man make camps centered around themes. And, you know, you have scheduled events and you have, you know, consistent spaces that people can come in and hang out. Um, so I help run one of those with a, a really great team of people that just make amazing things happen. Um, but I also uh, have recently started volunteering for um, one of the larger volunteer courts at, at Firefly that make things happen, which is the Fire Safety Corps. Okay. Um, I'm on that with one other person. Um, and between him and me, we take care of, you know, all the fire regulations for fire pits. Um, we handle any any art that people are making with uh, with fire, you know, with propane poofers, anything like that. We inspect them. We make sure it's going to be in a safe place. Uh, it's going to be run responsibly, things like that. Uh, and we handle, you know, the, the larger effigy burn uh, at the end that is a big characteristic of, of uh, most festivals like this. Um, talk with the fire marshal, get the proper burn permits, make sure everything's at a safe distance, things like that. So those are the major things on my on my plate um, for the camp. Um, I'm kind of a catch-all guy. Uh, my partner and I kind of rolled in 2013, 2014, and and picked up the the leadership that was missing in the camp to to make us a little bit more cohesive and open to the community um, and. Like I said, we've picked up a great team of people along the way, which has meant that I've I've been able to entrust other people with um, with different responsibilities that I might not be the best at, such as running our music stage, um, you know, handling membership dues, figuring out how many people are going to come and where they're going to camp, things like that. And I've settled into some of the roles that I feel like I excel at more, which is um, helping with the lighting around camp. Um, we have a space uh, we call the um, uh, the Lions Lounge, which is just basically kind of a soft soft spot in the camp filled with pillows. So you can just like come, lay down, chill out, relax. You can see the stage and the fire spinning circle from it. So it's just a comfy spot. We're, we're really about comfort there. It's right next to our Amex City. Um, and I also <laughs> help build a lot of the furniture we build up there. Um, so that's kind of always on my list to do. Um, I was thinking this year, I was actually just talking with a friend uh, the other night about um, thinking about building a project this year. One of the great things about um, Firefly especially is they do have money for art grants. Um, they have an art, art grant process where if you have an idea for something, you can submit a proposal for it. Uh, again, there's a volunteer panel of people who um, will go through those proposals and decide who gets who gets budget for it. And frankly, if you have a good idea that's interactive and you show you know what you're doing and that you're really committed to doing a project right, you will get at least a couple couple bucks, a couple funds, if not fully funded, for, for what you need to do. Um, so I've been thinking about putting something in for that. Um, I'm a huge D&D &D nerd <laughs> at heart. Um, and one of the dice towers that I got uh, a couple years ago is it's kind of a nice laser 
cut piece of balsa wood and all the parts just kind of slot into each other. Nice. Um, and I've been wanting to build a huge version of that, something that kind of comes <laughs> up to your head or chest, build a dice to scale, um, and kind of have some tables for people to roll on. It's like, oh, what should I do next to Firefly? Or what costume should I wear? You know, something along those lines and just have a spot where you can roll some dice and, and see where your adventure should take you. So um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see how that uh, fleshes out. Like, in terms of how interactive it is, sort of like a scavenger hunt, but instead of uh, this path to find clues, it's it's kind of randomized and a little bit more unique of an experience to each person. Yep. Yep, pretty much. You know, it's... it's um, I like that take on it a lot. Um, you know, I'd be lying if I said it didn't kind of form from just my own need of just like, I want to roll, I like rolling lots of small dice. I would like to roll lots of big what dice. Reason do I have to, what can I come up with as a reason to roll a bunch of big dice? You know, some, sometimes that's that's how art can start. It's just like, hey, I want, I want to do this thing. Necessity and, you know, is the mother of invention. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great. So, well, yeah, hopefully that'll um, that will uh, pan out for me. But if not, like I said, I have I have plenty to make in camp. I I make similar style um, furniture for camp, kind of the slotted furniture that doesn't require any screws or anything, just so we have seating and and surfaces around camp. So, I'm kind of always in the process of refurbishing stuff from last year, seeing what needs replacing, seeing if I want to build any new stuff, things like that. So, oh, I always got a to-do list. <laughs> Sounds like you're very much a Renaissance man when it comes up. Uh, it comes to this like eclectic list of skills. Like it, it seems like you're a person who, when you want to know how to do something, you kind of just will figure out how to do it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I like to feel like that. You know, um, it's been nice getting nudges along the way. Um, you know, the experience I had with jumping into fire spinning where it's just like, oh, you're, you know, no disrespect, but you're just some guy. I thought you were a superhero. If you're just some guy, I'm just some guy. I can do that, um, which I think I got a little bit of the spark of uh, going through our art college, you know, mm. coming in as this quiet kid who doodled in his notebook a lot. And I'm watching these people put on, you know, uh, full performance art that they commit to. Or, you know, these large band projects or, you know, beautiful oil paintings or anything like that. You see people doing all these talented things, but it's just like, oh, dude, I I just saw you, you know, get sick eating too much macaroni and cheese in the lunchroom the other day. You're just the dude. And you're just putting time and effort into a space just like I could. Yeah. Um, it, it's still impressive not to be too reductive about it. Mm. It's very impressive to see the results, but the, the path is clear. And it, it comes down to your decision and your um, discipline and, and effort that you put into it to get something out of it. So, you know, when you look at things like that in terms of a lot of self-expression skills like that, you're not that limited. You're really only limited by what, what you're scared to try and, um, you know, what you do or don't want to put the effort into. Oh, I absolutely I I, I agree with to that. That's a lot of the philosophy behind starting this channel was just trying to put in time and do what I could to express. Yeah, that's, that's great. I I, I, I I think that's really it's a it's a great way to go about this is having these interviews with people, you know, I, I think is is approaching that same experience that I had. You're you're humanizing people. I, I think one of the really great tragedies that people understand about the arts is, or misunderstand about the arts, is this myth of inborn talent. Mm -hmm. um, I think that some people do have brains that may or may not pick up certain skills easier than others, but that doesn't mean it's not still work. You know, mm -hmm. that it, it's, it's always work. You know, when someone says, I, I wish I could draw like you, you know, I wish I could fire spin like you, anything like that. It's just like, oh, well, you totally can. I have put this many hours into it. I've failed this many times. I've been frustrated this many nights with it. If you do all that same thing, you might even be better at me than it. If you have a particular, mm. you know, uh, a brain that might pick this up um, and understand these systems a little bit easier than I do. Well, um, then... You know, I, 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 I it, it, it really 
is a shame when uh, I hear people talk like that because it, it's just you're limiting yourself and that that is the exact opposite of the feeling that I talked about earlier where you can see people being inspired and wanting to do something and you can see that art spreading exponentially when I see someone saying like oh, I could never do that he was just born with that talent you, you kind of feel that brick wall dead end of like full no like don't don't just leave that there and go home and be bored go go do it go try it what's the worst you can do fail everyone fails well, all skill is just a, a a compilation of failures until you don't you know and then thinking about you with starting with the rope dart i think even if people have this i think talent as far as aptitude for what you learn easily absolutely exists like you mentioned but when you think about you at first with the staff feeling like that's what fire spitting is supposed to be that's what you've seen and it wasn't quite clicking and then you tried the rope dart and it felt more right i think even if you don't have a natural aptitude with the approach you feel like you're supposed to have with an activity you can find something that suits you. You can find your own path. Um, I think there's a lot of artists uh, who, obviously visual art is what I have more knowledge in, but I've seen a lot of artists who lack a particular skill, so they develop a style where as much as they try their best to learn that skill and they work hard at it, they create an art style that leans into what they are good at, um, that mm -hmm. favors mm -hmm. where their aptitude is, and they use their hard work to get as good as they can at the things that are hard for them and to learn how to make the most of the things that are easier. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you raise a great point there in that you, you learn things about yourself. You learn what you take to easier. You learn what you pick up easier. And in that sense, you can really start to see uh, the value of art to mm -hmm. an individual, to a society. It is a, it is a form of introspection. It is a, a form of, of self-discovery. It's, it's finding out things about yourself. It's finding out how you work, how you think, how you learn, and you know how, how you respond to situations. How do you respond to failing to do something 20 times? Do you try it 21 times, or do you stop and you walk away? How are you feeling when you fail like that? Are you um, encouraged because you know each failure is is teaching you a lot or are you getting upset at things you know it, with those kind of insights you can you can look at yourself and carry that that kind of knowledge to any non-art part of your life if if such a thing exists you know but um mm -hmm. it's it i think art is is really important and um it's unfortunate to see it be um or undervalued a lot sometimes as just kind of a, a luxury where I, I think it is kind of an important part of human experience is to find something that you like creating some form of expression, whether that's something as wild and outlandish as, you know, fire spinning or <laughs> trapeze or something as small as having a tomato garden and just being able to eat a couple tomatoes a year that you grow or writing a couple little short stories that you might not even show to anyone and just, just having having that be your your small little outlet your way of learning about yourself and processing what you know and think about the world i think it's it's very hard to be human without that kind of an experience and i think a lot more people than they think are artists in their own way i think it's a really beautiful sentiment um that feels like a really natural uh, conclusion, but it's a bit early. Is there anything you feel like you really want to say before we call the interview for the day? I mean, I I would just reiterate, honestly, what I've been talking about this whole time. You know, if you see something cool, go try it. Go, go look it up. I mean, especially now with how online learning is, it it's easier than ever to find somebody else who is into the thing, to find somebody who's good at the thing, you know, don't don't be scared of it you know the, the worst thing that you can do is fail and who cares we have a million failures every day and like i was saying before you look at failure right it's experience it's not a failure the real failure is not doing a thing is is gi giving up and giving into despair on things um mm -hmm. you know I, I really do believe everyone has some form of expression uh that they can do and I, I would really encourage everybody to to be open to that and and really really look around for what it is 
that that lights that fire inside you. And in addition to that, (laughs) that one was unintended. Absolutely. Uh, In addition to that, you know, find, find the people that want to stoke that fire in you, find the people that get excited when you tell them about it, you know, find, find the people that are even more excited about these kinds of things than you and hang out with them, see what you learn from them. And, and, you know, give back, I think, to the community is is really the biggest thing that I've learned through my experience with all of this is you find a good community that supports you and you feel supported and it brings you to a place where you're happy, turn around and give that back. That's the only way you're going to keep this kind of thing going. You know, uh, you, you always want more people making art and discouraging someone from making art is, I think, a, a failure for for everyone it's it's a loss on an individual scale it's a, a loss in the community scale so um you know be open to things i think especially for artists and and things that are normally considered a little bit weird um look into things more have the experience yourself um before you really make a judgment on it um i think especially the way we were talking about you know the media depictions of, of things like burning man or or similar events you know don't don't take those things at, ta- at face value investigate them yourself and if that's the conclusion you come to after you do it yourself that's fine i'm not saying that that kind of lifestyle and event is for everyone it's not you know uh, different strokes different folks and all that but i think that there are lessons from that kind of community that you can bring elsewhere um and you know find find what that elsewhere is for you and and dive into it and you know uh live it as authentically as you can and um yeah find your art really i think is is what i would really want to (laughs) tell people that i think is a really beautiful sentiment um thank you so much for that i i genuinely feel like i've learned a lot not just about uh fire spinning the boston arts community uh festivals but just about art and life and so much from talking to you thank you so much for this uh, conversation i've had such a blast oh yeah thank you so much this this was really great it's um you know when you're saturated in a community like this i i rarely get to you know blab about it at at length (laughs) so it's 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 great to be able to kind of externalize this and um and you know introduce people to to something maybe they they weren't as familiar with and you know humanize it a little bit more encourage more people to do it i'm just a guy and i i picked up and learned stuff and and you can too 100 so, percent. Uh, thanks for enabling the message you know <laughs> and guys we're closing out here do you have any social media you want to plug any projects other than uh firefly obviously plugging that um no i you know i'd say yeah look up the firefly arts collective online uh, there is another electronic mu- music festival also called firefly so don't get fooled this one's called <laughs> firefly arts collective is the one you'll want to look up for this um you know my my insta is adam canvas um my website portfolio is the adam effect e-f-f-e-c-t dot com you can see videos of my fire spinning there you can see some of my um some of my other work my i do a lot of motion graphics uh and illustration work nice. um and body paint so uh you can check a lot of stuff out there you know i, I would love to hear from anybody you know re- reach out if uh you want to know more about this stuff i i would be happy to speak more at length about anything or or help direct someone to a community nearby them that is awesome i thank you again and i hope you and everybody else out there has a fantastic rest of the day I've had an absolute pleasure. I hope that you've had a good good time. Uh, Audience, Adam, everybody else. Until next time, have a good one. And uh, quick, before you, that's the end of the video part that'll be uploaded, but before you go, just in the part that's not for the video, I just want to just say a really genuine thank you. This was so much goddamn fun to talk about. (laughs) Thank you, man. No, it was great. It was very easy to talk to you. You... You had some really great prompts. You uh, you got me thinking in, in ways that I wasn't before. This this was an absolute blast. Uh, I appreciate how open you are, and um, 
uh, the questions you're asking, uh, what you know, what that brought out of me. So I, I really appreciate it, and I'm really glad that is exceptionally <laughs> high praise and all I could ever hope for. I just uh, jumped over to to Twitch to peek at your art. I didn't want to look at it during because I wanted <laughs> to concentrate on the interview. But wow, man, that is that is fantastic. Really great work. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Hey, when, uh, when you first said you spun fire, I was going to do like a series of poses rolling through, but the second uh, yeah. you mentioned that you did acts, I was, I, was I, have to, it, I have to focus on that. It has to be like this, just one picture highlighting, this is a fucking axe that's on fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh man, it's great, man. Thank you so much. This is great. You know, if, if you ever want me on again, I'd, I'd be more than happy to. Absolutely. Ah, oh, it's so great. It, it looks amazing, dude. Thank you so much.